Thank you, Cindy. The Assembly Committee on Government Affairs will come to order. Madam Secretary, please call roll. Assemblywoman Anderson. Assemblywoman Black. Here. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Ellison. Present. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblyman Matthews. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Assemblywoman Torres. Here. Chair Flores. Present. I'll let the record reflect all members of the forum. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you following us virtually, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we're going to take the agenda in the order it, it appears. I want to remind members to please keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking and to please keep your cameras on at all times. Um, for those of you wa watching this virtually, especially those of you who uh, perhaps may be joining us for the first time, know that we all have a unique setup, which is why you'll see us looking in different directions. It's not that we're not paying attention. Um, uh, I want to remind the presenters for today uh, to please state your name for the record to help our staff after each question. There's no need to go through the chair. Uh, uh, feel comfortable going direct to each member. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and take the presentation in the order as they appear, and we'll start off with our presentation from the City of Henderson. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, uh, Chair Flores, Vice Chair Torres, and esteemed members of the Assembly Government Affairs Committee. For the record, I'm Mayor Deborah March of the City of Henderson. And thank you for inviting me to share with you a snapshot of what makes Henderson such a premier community. I've been fortunate to serve as Mayor of Henderson since June of 2017. And prior to this role, I served as a member of the City Council from 2009 until being sworn into my current office. Although today I represent the City of Henderson, I'm proud of the regional role that we play in this state. I'm honored to be the first woman and first uh, mayor to be appointed to serve as chair of the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada, and I also serve as chair of the Regional Flood Control District. Henderson is proud to have spearheaded Southern Nevada Strong, the first comprehensive regional planning initiative in our region, which has expanded regional planning and collaboration in Southern Nevada ever since. We continue to work closely with the regional organizations and other cities in Southern Nevada and throughout the state on shared strategies. I bring a regional perspective to many of the issues facing Nevada, but today we're here to represent the residents, the businesses and employees of the city of Henderson to ensure that their voices are being heard in Carson City and that their needs can be known and addressed. Henderson is Nevada's second largest city with a population of more than 330,000 residents. We welcome an influx of new residents each month who are drawn to our community because of its exceptional quality of life, award-winning parks and trails, and expanding economic opportunities. Henderson is also Nevada's largest full-service city, providing police, fire, water, and wastewater services to the families and businesses who call Henderson home. I'm fortunate to serve alongside a dynamic city council that's committed to maintaining what has made Henderson such a special place to live, learn, work, and play for the people of all ages from every background. Today, you'll hear from our city manager, Richard Derrick, who leads the city's team and has been proudly serving Henderson, which is his hometown, since joining us in 1999. I want to take a moment to also thank all of the members of the Nevada legislature for your dedication to carrying out the duties of the offices for which you've been elected to serve. As a representative of local, of local government, I believe strongly in the partnership that we have with the state and recognize the importance of working together to serve the people that we represent. The COVID-19 pandemic has again showed us the importance of this partnership and highlighted the collective role that we all share in ensuring the health, safety, and the economic vitality of the communities across Nevada. I'm extremely proud of the City of Henderson's 
response to COVID-19. As a city, we were prepared for immediate emergency response and our community has come together to help friends, neighbors, and loved ones. We have the lowest transmission rate in the Valley due in part to our efforts to mitigate the spread of the virus. You'll hear from more of this later in this presentation about the services that we provide our residents that have been vital during this pandemic, including paramedic response, child care, educational support, meals for homebound seniors, and assistance grants to help families cover rent, utilities, and the cost of internet services. We also serve the needs of our businesses to ensure the safety of their customers and staff to keep workers on the job. While we continue to prioritize health and safety, including robust participation in a vaccine distribution effort, we're also focused on the recovery of our community and restoring the vital vitality of our economy. I appreciate your collaboration and look forward to working together on the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead for us. Thank you again for the opportunity to join you today. And it's truly my pleasure to introduce Mr. Richard Derrick, City Manager and CEO of the City of Henderson. Thank you, Mayor March. And thank you, Chairman Flores, Vice Chair Torres, and members of the Assembly Government Affairs Committee. For the record, my name is Richard Derrick, City Manager and Chief Executive Officer for the City of Henderson. Thank you for inviting us to be with you here today. Henderson is a council manager form of government, like one of most cities in Southern Nevada. Mayor March serves alongside her respective city council colleagues, which include Councilwoman Michelle Romero, Councilman Dan Shaw, Councilman John Mars, and Councilman Dan Stewart. I'd like to introduce you to my executive leadership team. From right to left on the screen, Assistant City Manager and Chief Strategy Officer, Stephanie Garcia Vaz, Deputy City Manager and Chief Operating Officer, Bristol Ellington, and Assistant City Manager and Chief Infrastructure Officer, Robert Herr. My leadership team, or various department heads and subject matter experts from our outstanding staff may be testifying before you on various bills. If you have any questions for me or anyone on the City of Henderson team, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Even during the pandemic, Henderson has continued to experience sustained growth with our population now exceeding 332,000. This places additional pressure on our infrastructure, public safety and utilities, especially in fast growing West Henderson along St. Rose Parkway from Eastern to I-15. We are the largest full service city in Nevada, providing police, fire, EMS, parks and recreation, public works, water and wastewater services. We are incredibly proud of our credit departments Oops. and we'll be discussing these services and the city's finances over this presentation. The city's unemployment rate sits at 8.8% as of December, 2020, compared to 3.9% from the same period in 2019. Like all of Southern Nevada, we saw a spike of unemployment to nearly 30% right after the governor's initial shutdown order this past March and has been dropping every month since then. But we still have a significant way to go to get back to our full employment and the city is committed to working towards getting this virus under control and getting people back to work as soon as possible. Over the years, Henderson has grown into a mature, vibrant and sophisticated city. Henderson is the place to call home and we consistently strive to provide premier services, amenities and opportunities for a great quality of life. That means investing in our students to help them become productive students and a skilled, educated workforce. That means ensuring our city is safe. It also means providing quality job opportunities and providing good roads and accessible parks and trails for outdoor recreation. That is the quality of life that people expect when they come to a community like Henderson. We are consistently recognized for our premier parks, trails, and are proud to be a two-time gold medal winner for the best parks and recreation system in the nation as awarded by the National Recreation and Parks Association. In 2020, we were honored once again to be a gold medal finalist. We have twice been honored with the International Outstanding Biz Building of the Year, or Toby Award, from the Building Owners and Managers Association for our Whitney Ranch Recreation Center and our Heritage Park Senior Center and Aquatic Center. 
This past year, we were ranked as the second safest large city in America by both Money Geek and Advisor Smith. We achieved that status thanks to our nationally accredited police and fire departments. Our police department is accredited by CALEA, the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. And our fire department is one of the nation's only triple accredited fire agencies accredited for fire, ambulance, and emergency management services. We are also proud of our American Public Works Association accredited public works and utilities departments. The city of Henderson has close to $200 million worth of buildings, roads, and parks under design and construction this calendar year, critical infrastructure projects that will help the economy recover and create and protect jobs. We are also actively working with the Governor Sisolak and Treasurer Conine to accelerate projects that would create significant jobs and speed economic recovery. We plan to seek funding to accelerate significant regional roadway projects, such as proposed interchanges on I-15 at Via Novella and Sloan, high traffic interchanges along I-215 and Green Valley Parkway at Pecos, and updating the I-215, I-515 interchange that is badly out of date with current traffic demand. Our utilities department is working with the Southern Nevada Water Authority on the horizon lateral to bring additional infrastructure to West Henderson and the western part of the valley. And we are pursuing utilities expansions at Nevada State College in order to support its growing student population. Affordable housing remains one of the city's pressing concerns as we recover from COVID-19. A Gwynn Center study so that almost 250,000 Clark County residents and 20,000 residents in Henderson could be at risk of homelessness if economic conditions do not improve. We will discuss this more on our COVID-19 response section, but we provided more than $1 million of our CARES Act funds for rental and mortgage assistance. And we continue to work with Clark County to support residents in need with rental and mortgage assistance funds approved by Congress late last December. The city of Henderson prioritizes efforts to revitalize maturing neighborhoods in our city through redevelopment efforts. Currently, the city has five redevelopment areas. The downtown redevelopment area pictured here is a historical heart of the city, where our partnership with the Knights organization on Lifeboat Arena has already paid off. Opening this last November at the former site of the Henderson Convention Center, this arena has been a catalyst for business investment and social activity in the historic downtown district. Private investment abounds throughout the district with numerous large mixed use projects planned in progress or recently completed. Landbar Arena is not only home to the Henderson Silver Knights, our city's first professional sports team, but it also serves as a community ice rink with youth and adult hockey leagues and open skate events for all Henderson residents. Additionally, a public-private partnership in building the Henderson Event Center, a facility like no other in Henderson. This new state-of-the-art entertainment that venue will expand opportunities for Henderson residents to work and play, featuring Silver Knights home games, the Henderson Symphony, and performing arts and community events like graduations. A number of impactful projects in Henderson are helping to diversify the economy of Southern Nevada. As part of the region's growing sports economy, our city is now home to the Henderson Silver Knights, the Las Vegas Rangers headquarters, and another sports team may soon be calling Henderson home as well. We are growing our technology base with the addition of companies like Google and Vanatech. Additionally, Amazon opened a 600,000 square foot distribution center last year and are currently constructing one of their last mile delivery distribution centers in West Henderson. Haas Automation, the world's largest manufacturer of machines that build machines, broke ground last year on their 2.4 square foot, excuse me, 2.4 million square foot advanced manufacturing center, which will bring 2,500 jobs over the next decade. We are also working with Haas, the College of Southern Nevada, and Workforce, Connect Workforce Connections to develop a Henderson Workforce Training Center for Excellence that will provide advanced manufacturing training for the highly skilled jobs right here in Henderson. Finally, Henderson Hospital West, 
has recently approved to break ground on a 40 acre campus that will bring that will include a new hospital and several medical office buildings. Our reputation is building with the world-class companies coming to Henderson, like the Raiders, Amazon, Google, and VGK. These major players will help us to attract additional high caliber businesses looking to expand or relocate. Our economic development team is working with the governor's office of economic development and the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance to aggressively target new business. And we are continuing our efforts with Clark County, the Bureau of Land Management, NV Energy and others to acquire additional land in order to build infrastructure. Our high performing public services and other priorities are driven by our five year strategic plan, which was adopted in 2019 after a collaborative, collaborative process with input from residents and key stakeholders. This plan aligns with both our Henderson Strong Comprehensive Plan and the Southern Nevada Strong Regional Comprehensive Plan. Our budgetary process also reflects these strategic priorities, which in turn informs the legislative priorities that we will be working with, uh, with you all this session. Now I'd like to share how the city has responded to the pandemic and use the CARES Act funding. When Governor Sisolak declared a public emergency in mid-March, and order non-essential business to close, our city was prepared for immediate response, emergency response, but we did not receive any Federal CARES Act funding until the end of July. That funding came through Clark County as the city was not eligible to receive direct assistance due to population limits by the Congress. Our allotment equaled about half of the funding the city would have received directly based on population. The remaining funds stayed with the county and were used to support regional services, testing, and contact tracing, and to assist the homeless and other at-risk populations. Additional dollars were also held in reserve for surge hospital capacity. We hear every day from families and businesses about the struggles they have encountered as a result of the pandemic. So we worked hard to align our CARES funding to meet their needs. We were also able to, excuse me, we were also able to step into recovery grants that are helping businesses recover, payroll with other expenses, and to keep their employees and customers safe. We were able to distribute over 500 grants, totaling more than 3.2 million to local businesses. We know there are thousands of residents in our community struggling with utility payments, distance learning, and childcare costs. We funded residence recovery grants to provide assistance to those, need, those in need and work with HopeLink to provide another $1 million for rental assistance. And we also set up emergency childcare for healthcare workers and first responders within 12 hours of the initial shutdown at no cost to these families so they can respond to the COVID crisis. And we've continued providing critical childcare and expanded this availability through our Battleborn Kids and Battleborn Academy programs, providing a safe space for children to engage in remote learning with the help of staff and tutors. We also received very positive feedback from our community on the grants and services provided during these trying times. And we wanted to share just a few thank you messages from residents and local businesses to provide insight into the impact they had. We hope to provide even more support if Congress approves additional COVID-19 relief funds in the coming, coming weeks. The city allocated the $29.6 million CARES Act funding we received from Clark County into several key areas of support for the community. About $10 million was used for COVID-19 response staff time, including first responders and other staff that have been providing essential services as part of our pandemic response. Another $7 million was dedicated to rental assistance, home utilities, support, childcare, and connecting students to the internet so they could engage in distance learning. We allocate six million to improve the city's teleworking infrastructure, which enabled over half of the city's employees to work from home. We also invested in the creation of a new online process for the submission of development plans, issuance of permits, and visual inspections 
to keep construction services going. We've expanded our Meals on Wheels program, doubling the number of recipients and the number of meals served, ensuring homebound seniors in need receive at least two meals a day. And we provide almost 3.2 million in local businesses, including 10,000 each for 100 struggling restaurants to help keep their doors open and employees working during this difficult time. The city continues to work with the Southern Nevada Health District and Community Ambulance to help administer the vaccine to our residents and first responders according to the state plan. We have prioritized the Southern City Anthem area where so many of our retired seniors live with a point of distribution for ages 70 plus and hope to expand vaccination operations to additional populations as soon as supply becomes available. We continue to follow the state of Nevada playbook guided by the Southern Nevada Health District who leads our region to help reach the eligible groups across the community with equity and fairness. We also want to provide you with an overview of our budget and financial effects that we are experiencing due to COVID-19 health and economic crisis. Our general fund revenues are budgeted at 262 million for FY 2021. Nearly 70% of our general fund is tax-based, leaving only a small portion that we actually control as a city. Most of our revenues are established through formulas based by statute. Intergovernmental resources, consisting mainly of consolidated tax, sea tax and property tax are by far the largest of our revenue sources. Public safety remains over half of our general fund budget. Add in parks and recreation, and 73% of our general fund budget goes towards these three areas, police, fire, and parks. As a city government, that provides full services to the community, most of that budget expense is in the form of salaries and benefits. We have maintained those premier services, programs, and amenities with the lowest tax rate among any major city in the state. You can see here, the Henderson's property tax rate is only 74 cents per $100 of assessed valuation, which is the lowest in the valley. We are fortunate that our property tax revenues have remained stable during this pandemic. The sales tax collections have seen a significant dip due to the economic crisis. This graphic illustrates the original estimates for our 2020 and 2021 consolidated taxes. And the red bar shows the estimated 36% reduction in collections. Sales taxes have come in a little better than originally estimated this past fall. But with many of our conferences and trade shows still canceled or postponed, we don't yet know how we will finish this fiscal year with CTAX. This slide outlines the adjustments made to our final budget filed with the Department of Taxation. We had to plan for up to $19 million to be used from our budget stabilization fund. However, we tightened our belt, made cuts where needed, and instituted both a salary and hiring freeze, so we are hopeful that we will not need to, to actually transfer that full amount budgeted. In talking with your staff, we know that the committee is interested to hear how the city is performing with federal grants. We have staff in our finance department dedicated to seeking and administering federal grants on behalf of the city. We have received awards from 24 federal programs this year for a total of $48 million. This represents about a 72% success rate for the funds we have requested. And we reach out to the federal departments and grants reviewers to solicit feedback on those that we do not receive funding so that we can improve future applications and continue to build on our success. These are our guiding principles as we continue to recover from COVID-19. We hope to avoid job losses and maintain our critical public services. And we will continue to seek additional federal funds to respond to the pandemic, to minimize the need to reallocate city resources. Our resource challenges reside primarily with CTAX and the speed at which the revenues will continue to recover. And we are hopeful that Congress will provide another stimulus fund soon. The city of Henderson is provided with two bill drafts each session. This year, our mayor and council decided to present just one for your consideration. AB 42 will be heard by the Judiciary Committees and it revises NRS to allow municipal courts to conduct jury trials 
in compliance with the Nevada Supreme Court's Anderson decision. The bill is permissive and allows a jurisdiction to conduct the trial or refer to the district court. We are fortunate to have a government affairs team dedicated to working with you throughout the session, led by Nicole Rourke, our Director of Government and Public Affairs, along with David Cherry, Government Affairs Manager, and Mike Cathcart, Business Operations Manager. They are always available to answer questions and work with you on bills that have the potential to impact the city of Henderson. Thank you, Chairman Flores and members of the committee. That concludes our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have for us. Thank you for your presentation. Sorry, I was trying to get my screens to work here. Um, we do have some members that have some questions. Um, and, and as always, members, I ask that you refrain uh, from going into any questions relating to any particular piece of legislation. I prefer that we keep the conversation broad. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll start with our vice chair. Thank you, Chair, and thank you um, to the City of Henderson and Mayor for your presentation. I really do appreciate it. Um, and I know we didn't talk too much about um, the City of Henderson's Police Department, so I wanted to focus on that just for a little bit um, and, and see if you could talk about what efforts uh, the City of Henderson has made and the Henderson Police Department have made um, to focus on training for cultural competency um, and anti-racist and discrimination training um, because I know that the city of Henderson over the last year has been under fire quite a bit in our media um, for allegations of discrimination. So I want to know if the if the municipality has made any decision to kind of respond to that through training. For the record, Richard Derrick, city of Henderson, and, and thank you for the question, Vice Chair Torres. Uh, the city of Henderson actually has gone through um, an, an interesting time, and I uh, I we appreciate your your comments. Um, you know, we went through a police chief that uh, actually, um, for us, did not fit our culture, and for um, we actually have parted ways with that police chief. But she brought in a wonderful deputy police chief who has actually been promoted to police chief. He's African American. He has a wealth of knowledge and experience in working in a very um, a climate that actually values diversity and has actually implemented training for our police force on inclusion and diversity. And we have made, I, I believe, great strides in that space. And so I, I feel like as if the police department is really uh, moving forward in the ensuring that we're providing consistency um, to our community as far as policing goes. As the mayor mentioned before, we have been um, actually awarded being the second uh, safest city nationally, second safest largest city nationally. And so our men and women in blue have done a, a tremendous job in policing our community. Um, and we'll continue to again, ensure consistency and training, ensure consistency in the way that we're dealing with our community. Um, and I, I have a complete and utmost confidence in our police chief. He's just a phenomenal um, individual who has a great vision for our entire police force. Follow up if I may? Follow up, Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and I thank you for that response. And I, I do appreciate that you, the city of Henderson has continued to um, have individuals of color in leadership positions, um, not just in the police um, department, but in other areas as well. But I, I don't think simply having an individual of color is enough. So I would definitely like to get more information about the trainings that are available. And, you know, regard, regarding the matter of the former police chief, I, I just would urge the city of Henderson um, against using language like she doesn't fit our culture. I think that um, kind of perpetuates the same rhetoric um, and the same response that the community has already used. Uh, additionally, I think that it's important that we note that the city of Henderson has continued to keep a lot of the former police chiefs policies in practice since then. Um, and so I, th I think it's just really important to, for us to evaluate what we're looking about and what that culture is defined by, because I, I haven't seen anything that tells me um, exactly what that what that difference was, considering the current police chief has kept several of her um, former policies and regulations in place. Thank you. 
For the record, Richard Derrick, City of Henderson, and thank you again for the question, Vice Chair Torres. We will make sure that you, we forward to you the actual training that we are, are putting our, our police force through as far as, again, um, value, diversity, and inclusion. Again, it's been a formalized process, and so we'll be happy to share that with you as well. And, you know, I apologize again from maybe as far as my um, terminology, I, you know, as you know, and there, there's a history behind um, our, our past police chief that we did try to ensure um, success there, and we tried our, our best through some training and, and efforts that so we had, and just were not able to get there. Um, but again, as, as I mentioned before, our new police chief um, has some similar uh, policies in place. He's made some changes as well, um, but we, I believe the department is moving forward in, in, in a, a positive way, and we'll be happy to share that information with you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Considine. Thank you, Chairman Flores, and thank you for, for the presentation. I actually have two questions. One of them is uh, being a new legislator and going through all these presentations, it's been incredibly educational. But what I'm noticing is that um, looking at budgets, the definition of public safety or what areas within public safety are considered are very differently. So I was wondering if you would please um, send the committee uh, a breakdown of the expenditures, like what falls under public safety when Henderson considers public safety, that would be very helpful um, to me and others on the committee. Uh, second question is, when I first moved back to uh, back to Nevada, I actually, I lived in Henderson. I lived off of what was then Lake Mead Drive. So looking at um, your plans for the changes around Water Street and knowing a lot of people who live there and work there, my question um, for this is about affordable housing. Looking at all of the, the new plans for that area and knowing that there were neighborhoods that were built when uh, BMI and, and World War II were built and a lot of people, those are what they can afford. And your earlier statement about doubling Meals for Wheels, I'm just very curious and interested in what your plan is to keep affordable housing in Henderson for, um, for, for the workers that can't afford in like Sun City, Summerlin and those areas. Oh, thank you, Mayor Deborah March, for the record. Uh, Henderson is committed to uh, ensuring that we have affordable housing for all of our residents to be able to live, work, and play in our community. And, and in the area immediately around the Water Street District, we actually uh, have been directed by the federal government that we can't build additional affordable housing in that area because we have uh, too much affordable housing in that district. However, we're looking at other areas. West Henderson, we have two or three projects that we're looking to, to develop in the West Henderson area to ensure that the, the properties are affordable for our workforce to be able to come into our community. And there are many other projects across the city of Henderson that we're looking at affordability as well as uh, north on the Boulder Highway um, and, and other areas throughout the city. So we are committed to affordable housing and, and building it where we can and working with uh, the development community to ensure that they're building the product that our residents need and deserve. Thank you. That's great to hear. And if I uh, may ask a follow up on what you're building in the West Henderson area, will that also be close to like a transportation hub um, or, you know, accessible for folks that might not uh, have vehicles or need to travel? Deborah March, for the record, as, as chair of the Regional Transportation Commission, I work closely with the RTC to provide transit opportunities. West Henderson is a, is a relatively new growth area, as is the southwest of, of Southern Nevada, and we're working closely to try to get expanded services. Obviously, as revenues have been down, transit has been impacted in, in Southern Nevada. And so as we look to grow, uh, and expand transit to new areas where folks can get out of their cars. That's an important priority for us, especially in our Henderson Strong Strategy and in the Southern Nevada Strong Strategy. We want folks to be able to uh, travel around the valley and have options and opportunities uh, that include transit. Uh, that, that's going to have a cost associated with it. And we're working closely, again, with the RTC and uh, the transit providers for Southern Nevada to ensure that we can grow into these areas. Thank you very much. And I, I look forward to seeing how, how all of that works out. Thanks. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Brown-Maine. Thank you, Chair Flores. Thank you, Mayor. 
Um, I appreciate your comments. Uh, my questions this morning are relative to economic diversification. And specifically, I'm looking at slide 17, um, where you have Haas automation listed. Um, and so I'm curious to know, you talked about workforce training. Um, with regard to the Haas automation piece, are we specifically looking at workforce development training for that industry alone? Or will there be a diversified effort um, to, to focus on workforce training? And then my second question is the Henderson Hospital West. Um, I'm curious to know, is that a for-profit entity or, or are you looking at a not-for-profit or community hospital in that regard? Thank you, Deborah March, Mayor of Henderson for the record. With regards to Haas Automation, um, they and, and the workforce training that we're looking at for the West Henderson area, uh, we actually worked to recruit the Haas uh, facility into our community, knowing that we needed to diversify our economy. That uh, after the, the downturn in 2009, we recognized that uh, we couldn't be dependent upon the gaming community for uh, the revenues that we had expected in the past that we needed to diversify. Thus, we looked at recruiting other businesses and industries. And I actually sat on a roundtable in 2017, right after I became mayor, with uh, Michael Bloomberg. And at that roundtable, we talked about what we needed to be focusing on to recruit businesses and industries for the future, industries that will be here long after we're gone, 100 years from now. Well, we, when we had an opportunity to meet with the Haas Automation folks, we recognized how critical they were to diversifying the economy that uh, they build the machines that build machines and they export to over 60 countries and they were a target industry for us. So as we're looking at workforce training for this industry, our hope is that Haas will trigger other opportunities, other businesses that will want to locate here because uh, we're training this workforce. And, and Haas has taken a risk on us because we didn't have a trained workforce, but they are working with us to ensure that we are training up a workforce and hopefully uh, other industries that support theirs as well as other advanced manufacturing opportunities will come to our community as well. And, and this workforce training facility will definitely address all of those concerns. So it won't be just limited to Haas, but Haas will certainly be a trigger for future opportunities. With regards to the Henderson Hospital, that is a for-profit facility. However, just down the street from the new facility that's planned for West Henderson is the St. Rose Dominican Hospital, which is a not-for-profit not hospital located in Henderson as well. Thank you, Assemblywoman. If we could go next to Assemblyman Ellison. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mayor, it's good seeing you again. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, I, I got a couple questions for you, and, and God, they had some great answers out there and questions, uh, you know, about the hospitals and stuff. I'm glad you're looking at some of the nonprofit issues because some of the one, the one we have in Elko is, is for profit, and people are now going out of state. So it, it does have an impact on the community. Um, one of the questions I've got, it, it was an article that came out yesterday or the day before on Las Vegas and, and one of the most break-in states around is what I'm looking at is right now it's, uh, you guys won the uh, safety award for uh, Safe a City 2020 to 2021 and right now with the amount of break-ins because of COVID-19, are you seeing an increase in crime in, in Henderson? Yeah. yeah. For the record, Richard Derrick, CEO of the City of Henderson, thank you for the question. I We are seeing in different segments, we are seeing an increase in some crimes, uh, especially some domestic violence crimes. I, I think probably a factor of the pandemic with folks being held down in their homes. Um, we're seeing more there and we are seeing additional break-ins as, as well. And so those are areas that our police force are targeting. Um, but again, overall crime rate for us is, is relatively low. Um, but um, the nice thing about our police force is they use community policing. So they get to know their surroundings and their neighborhoods and they also are very data driven. And so they're able to target areas where they see patterns of crime activity. And so they've been very successful in actually 
being able to counteract break-ins that were happening with cars, some vandalism. And so um, we have some problem solving units, PSU units that really focus on those areas. And so I think it's part of the proactive response to deal with the crime that's occurring, but I think it's a concern for all of us and, and, and community well-being. And I think part of it is the sign of the times with the pandemic that we're in. There's just a lot of added stress to the community itself. And that's why we're trying so hard in, in trying to provide assistance to businesses, assistance to homeowners, um, and trying to help them to take some stress out of their lives. Because again, we just know that we're feeling tension in the community with the pandemic. Mayor Deborah March, for the record, and I think also the the idea of getting kids back into school would be very valuable in terms of looking at some of the crimes that we're experiencing, because many of them are petty crimes where kids are breaking into cars at night, and if those kids were maybe directed and focused on the things that they need to be focusing on in school, that might be very valuable as well. And and I thank you for that, because that's what I believe, too, if to get the kids off the street and and back in school and, and have them focus on the right things. That's that's a great idea and thank you. And then uh, just for closing is uh, my daughter spends a lot of time back and forth. Uh, she's a hockey addict, so she spends a lot of time in Henderson. So she just wanted me to tell you that uh, she'll be back shortly as soon as you open. So, so thank you. Have her call us. <laughs> thank you, Assemblyman. Next, if we could go to Assemblywoman Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mayor Marsh and crews out there in Henderson. Um, I just wanted to say in my time on the city council in Mesquite, um, we did talk about uh, setting up, you know, our financial situation similar to what Henderson does. You guys are always very organized and diligent about being financially sound, which, which that was a something that we worked towards while we were while I was on the council in Mesquite. I also want to commend you because I know that um, you guys really take care of your staff. There were several staff members, city staff members when I was in Mesquite that constantly talked about how great it would be to work in Henderson. And so I know that you guys are the you're the premier place for taking care of your people as well. So I wanted to commend you on that. And also the quality of life and just the infrastructure that you're building in Henderson are phenomenal. I wanted to commend you on that as well. I think, I believe if I'm correct, you guys were also working on setting up a, um, a preschool. Am I correct? Yes. So that's, yes, we have. that's great. Definitely and then I think from an economic development standpoint, you guys always go above and beyond. And I just want to say that uh, I'm proud to have part of assembly district number 19 be Henderson. So thank you for all that you do. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You. Richard Derrick, for the record, and, and I appreciate your comments on the preschool. We um, That was something that we actually consciously, Mary Council, were really focused on um, trying to enhance the pre-kindergarten, pre pre-K before they get to school for some of our kids in, in our disadvantaged areas. And we were able to double the capacity in our rec center, believe it or not. We're, we're, we're not a, obviously not running a for-profit preschool. It's in our rec center, but, um, and it actually provides scholarships for children. And so able to get kids into school um, in, in, in those critical ages before they actually join the K through 12. And I, I really appreciate the fact that council, we're kind of in our, out of our lane a little bit. Sometimes we talk about, we're, I guess we're criticized a little bit about, you know, that's not your typical thing that, a city would be involved in, but it's just so important for our community to ensure that our kids are ready for school. And so I just really appreciate the leadership that our American Council have shown in, 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 in that space. And so thank you for those comments. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Duran. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. It is. Um that Henderson's really doing really well. My concern is uh, with the pandemic and the um, homelessness, has it, has it increased since we've had so much job loss and stuff like that? And are you or do you have any uh, projects or homes to help the homeless, homelessness people or the homeless people? Sorry. Again, Richard Derrick, City of Henderson. I appreciate the question. It, um, homelessness in the city does exist, contrary to sometimes people think that does not occur. Obviously, it's, it's a valley-wide, very regional issue, and we have served on the regional 
task force looking at homelessness and have worked on different strategies region wide. And so a lot of uh, social services are coordinated through Clark County. And so what we've tried to do is reach those services and bring them to Henderson so we could try to coordinate, uh, you know, in a regional effort. And so right now we've worked with them bringing the harbor to downtown Water Street to kind of provide some ser services and a conduit back to social services with Clark County. We're also looking at, you know, uh, a contract now where we actually have a hotel on, on a relationship with the hotel so we can put people up on a temporary basis while we're, they're going through a transition. And so we're trying to think of this as a regional issue and trying to be very strategic in our approach. It is a challenge, obviously, for folks that may be losing um, their homes, and that's why we appreciate extension of maintaining um, folks in their homes and not allowing them to be evicted. And so we spent a lot of time and actually put our money, we just got a direct allocation for the federal government for rental assistance and actually working with the county on our very regional approach. So when folks put forth their applications, we're looking at that valley-wide, not just the city of Henderson. And so um, it is an effort and an issue that is valley-wide, but I, I believe that the city is taking a strategic approach looking at it from a regional perspective. May I have a follow up, please? Is um, with those people that you have, do is there maybe some place that can provide wraparound services for them to ensure that they can continue or help them get um, off the streets and into a home? Deborah March, for the record, Mayor of Henderson. Uh, we work closely with Hope Link, the nonprofit organization, as well as Clark County, because they're administering that $9 million that we turned over to them to be able to help folks that, that are in need. Um, but closely, in terms of social services and wraparound services, we've worked with, with Hope Link to provide those services for the city of Henderson. Thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you, Assemblywoman. I'm just checking the chats now to make sure I didn't actually skip anybody. Members, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself at this time and state your name for the record. Seeing none, I wanted to thank all of you for, for your presentation. Thank you for joining us this morning. I know that this conversation will continue. Um, and I know collectively, we all want the same things, right? We want to take care of our folk and want to make sure that uh, there's transparency and that we're growing and we're helping each other out. So thank you again for the dialogue conversation this morning. Uh, reach out if I could be of assistance in any way. Uh, members, and thank you uh, for those questions. At this time, I'd like to close out the presentation by the city of Henderson. And next, I'd like to invite uh, the city of Sparks. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Chair Flores. It's, it's nice to see you. Uh, for the record, Ed Lawson, Mayor of Sparks. And good morning to the committee. And a uh, special good morning to our, our two representatives that are sitting on your committee, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Anderson and Dickman. Thank you guys for your service in Sparks. Um, I'm going to give you a short presentation, a little bit about Sparks, what uh, some of our challenges are, and tell you a little bit about us. Um, we're kind of a, a bedroom community, if you will, to uh, Reno. Uh, we're very much family oriented. Uh, when we make decisions in the city of Sparks, we, we come at it with the, that those rose covered glasses on. Is this a good decision for our, our people that live with us and raising families? So let's start off with our city council. Mr. Poop, I think you have the presentation for us. Okay. And uh, with our city council. So, as I said, I'm the mayor, uh, Ed Lawson. Um, I've been on the city council for 10 years. I was a mayor pro tem. And when uh, Ron Smith, our previous mayor, passed in August, uh, I became the mayor in September, four and a half. We range in experience on our council from uh, the mayor pro tem currently, which is Charlene Bybee in Ward 4 uh, with six years, uh, Christopher Dare with uh, just over four, Councilman Anderson two years, and uh, Councilman Abbott just over four. And, and then we have our newest member, 
Diane Vanderwell, who took my place in Ward 2. Uh, we have a great council. We work well together. And we all seem to be rowing in the same direction, which is uh, a good thing, because that doesn't always happen in uh, politics. So here's our legislative team, myself, uh, obviously the mayor pro tem, Bybee, city manager, Neil Krutz, assistant city manager, Allison McCormick, and then uh, Kemper Krauss uh, represented for us is Michael Hill Hillaby. And uh, Mike will be the one that you guys uh, have most of your questions on procedures and, and whatnot. He'll be your, your main contact, although we are all available at any time. Next. So here's a little bit about Sparks. Uh, a lot of people don't realize we're, we're kind of a, a little bit bigger than small. It's kind of an easy way to put it. We're currently around 103,000 uh, residents and uh, our budget is 243 million. Obviously most of that is, is dedicated to certain areas. You can see uh, the majority of our revenue uh, comes from property taxes and consolidated C tax which you know, represents roughly about 70% uh, of our, our revenues in the city. So we have uh, currently 553 positions, uh, full-time positions in the city of Sparks. On your next slide, uh, I'm gonna show you, go ahead, Neil. We wanna compare this a little bit, because we, you know, this recession has really hurt us badly in, uh, in our growth and, and the way that we do business in the city of Sparks. So you can see our population is 2008 was 92,000. Our budget was uh, around uh, 195 million. And our full time employees, that's full time equivalent. That means all the lifeguards uh, before and after school care, uh, all the things that we do, uh, temporary help to uh, mow parks and whatnot, is, was at uh, 844 in 08. And we have 618 now. So we're doing the same job with more residents with 220 roughly less people to do that work. And then as you can see, our property tax revenue has been uh, barely keeping up, if, if at all, with uh, inflation. And that's something that uh, we're hoping that at some point we can have a, a, a real discussion on fixing our property tax system. This group's so here's our big challenges. Running, we're running out of land. So, talking with some several developers in in our area, you know, we're, we're basically the same way Las Vegas was when I was growing up there. We're surrounded by BLM land, and we really have about. I, I, I apologize to interrupt you. Um, we're just having a very difficult time with the sound. If I could have you just get a little bit closer into to your microphone, see if that would help on our end. I'm okay. at it for minute purposes. We're not gonna be able to uh, quite decipher some of that. So I, I apologize for interrupting. So is this better than Chair Flores? Much better, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so our, our big challenges are, are running out of land, obviously, you know, surrounded by BLM. And so our uh, challenge for the future is to keep up with that uh, that growth because in the way our property tax system works in Nevada we have to continually be building homes in order to keep up with the depreciation part of it the other part of it is our regional wastewater treatment facility uh, our facility is roughly 70 years old at this point it needs some major upgrades we're looking at upgrades now uh, on the low end of about 250 million to the high end at close to a billion dollars or three quarters of a billion dollars. And uh, so that's not gonna be an easy undertaking. We share this facility with the city of Reno and Spark in part of Waco County. So this is truly a regional facility uh, where uh, Spark runs the facility, but uh, Reno and, and Marshall County pay fees to it. So. And then our uncertain financial future, obviously, uh, COVID exposed some severe uh, breaks in our system. But luckily, we, we had planned early on and, and through a, since about 2010 was to keep our technology up to date. And we were able to uh, send people home and still not interrupt the services we provide at the city of Spark. So I think 
you know, that, that helped us uh, tremendously, but we're just not sure where we are for the future. Uh, with not being able to grow, one of the, the, the projects that we've taken on uh, is European model where you have city centers. So, and we'll, so let's go on to the next slide, Mr. Cruz. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Let's just talk about some of the things that we do, the fun things in, in Sparks. It's, uh, we have the rib cook-off, where we run about 500,000 people through downtown Sparks in uh, a six day period that uh, we also have the hot August night, which is one of the largest uh, car shows in America with over 6,500 uh, registrants. I sit on that, that board also. And the thing that we're probably uh, most proud of is our uh, hometown Christmas parade. We've been recognized nationally for that. We have over 300 entries and the parade itself lasts anywhere from three hours to four hours uh, the weekend before Christmas. And it's just a great family event that we get a huge turnout for. And then the, our emerging event that we really are proud of too is called Pumpkin Palooza, which is an uh, event where- Sir, I apologize for stopping you again, but I think we're having the same problem again with, with your microphone. If I could just ask that you get a little bit closer to it. All right. Well, I'm, you're going to look at my tie then. <laughs> that, that's perfect. And, okay. and, and right now we're focused on your, uh, on your slides, so, but I, I appreciate that. It's just we're having a really hard time um, okay. getting everything you're, you're delivering here. So thank you. Is that better? Perfect. Sure. Okay. So the Pumpkin Palooza is an event that started with about a thousand people. This last year we had it, it was over 10,000 people. So, and this is an event that's about five years old and that's an extremely family oriented event. So we're pretty proud of, of the way that that's uh, come up. And then the next slide, please. In keeping with that, that city center idea, we've had a tremendous growth in the Victorian Square area, which is roughly a six square block area. We've had a developer come in and put in apartments. We're gonna have 5,000 people living in a six square block area here in the next couple of years. It's gonna be its own vibrant community that will, you know, creating more energy for the downtown area and we'll still be able to have our special events and create that. The Nugget has uh, built an amphitheater that's right in the heart of Victorian Square and that holds uh, 8,500 people, uh, 8,500 people for concerts, which is awesome because if you know uh, the way concerts work, they usually start in San Francisco or Northern California and they work their way across I-80. So we're getting some very good uh, entertainers that uh, coming through this area. Mr. Cruz, next. And then the Sparks Marina and our outlets at Legend. The Sparks Marina, just uh, as way of background, was an old uh, aggregate pit. And in the 1997 flood, when uh, you know we, we basically flooded our industrial area with around two and a half, three feet of uh, water, the, the aggregate pit was overflowing, was ready to take out I-80. So uh, we, we managed to stave that off but the idea came out of it from previous city councils. You know what, let's turn this into a park and the marina has come about. And with that, we've had development come around it and uh, in the process right now, building more and more apartments around there. So it's quite a used uh, facility. There's a walkway path that goes all the way around. There's a swimming beach. And then of course, uh, plenty of fishing and a dog park where you can swim your dog in a uh, pretty, pretty nice little area. The Legends is, is an old uh, mall that was shuttered and just sat vacant forever. And we uh, sold that land off and had the Red Development come in and they built this uh, with Star Bonds uh, back in the day. They're doing a great job as they continue to build out. And let's go to the next slide, please. And this probably is the gem of Northern Nevada, probably in the United States. This is a Golden Eagle Recreation Park. We have six softball fields that generate uh, roughly $30 million in regional impact and uh, over 50,000 room nights come out of just six softball fields. 
Now there's a bunch of other fields. You can see that on the corner in the right, that's a nighttime view. And that ranges from all of you sports and baseball sports. So, but our, uh, our big deal is for the softball. Uh, there's, the fields are uh, artificial turf and uh, they, everybody loves to play on them. So you get a true bounce and the injuries are very few and minor. As, uh, as I remember playing in the old days, you know, the ball hit a rock and it could end up anywhere. So next. And then here's our contacts, Allison and Michael. So that'll be on your presentation. And then lastly, uh, we'll just take questions. Thank you. So, and, and I apologize for interrupting you there a few times. No and we were just uh, having a difficult time with, with the sound. Uh, but, but, but I do appreciate the presentation and I, I appreciate you walking us through it. Um, we have a few folk that have uh, some questions. We'll start off with Assemblyman Ellison. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I uh, was checking uh, just recently to find out if you guys are going to go through with Hot August Nights. I heard it might be canceled. Is, is that correct? Well, it's, uh, it's on a day-by-day -day basis. A lot of it's going to have to do with the... Uh, pandemic and what we can get on. I know sitting on the board, the board is absolutely wants to uh, to have the event. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I know it's it's kind of up in the air because we, we checked on the air races also. So it uh, I know that's got a large impact because, uh, you know, that's a great event you guys put on down there. So uh, anyway, uh, I'm hoping this event or this event does go well. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And and we love that event. It it brings it's a tremendous impact for our entire region, somewhere in the ninety million dollars of regional impact. So it's it's a huge event for all of us. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Consul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mayor Lawson, for the presentation. Um, I didn't see or I was wondering if it wasn't included, if you can send to the committee um, the the budget or the report on the, the expenditures of the revenue. I see the revenue, but I don't see, um, you know, the breakdown of where it's spent. So if that's possible, would you please send that to, to the committee? Absolutely, we will. That's not a problem. Thank you. And next we'll go to Assemblywoman Dickman. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. It's so good to see you. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation, but to say how impressive it is, how the leadership in Sparks has dealt with our growing little city, but keeping it a small town and a hometown feel. And, and also we need our festivals back because boy, do we miss them. Yes, ma'am, we certainly do. It's, it's what makes Spark unique is, is all of our special events and getting those families out and, and around. And it's just truly uh, the thing that makes us a great city. And, and, a, and a, a hometown small, big city. And you know, we're not as small as we used to be. And, and you know, we're, we're all also facing our own problems with uh, affordable housing and growth. You know, uh, since San Francisco and, and the pandemic and, and the ability for people to work remotely now, uh, we're seeing a huge influx of uh, California, roughly a little over half of the people that move to uh, our region right now are from California at some place within the proximity of the Bay Area. We see that continuing. I watched a real estate report, uh, homes under $600,000, we have 10 listed in the entire region. So uh, we, we're, in a, we're in a big way in need of more housing. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we have Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for your presentation, Mayor, um, and to the others 
team at the in the city of Sparks. Um, and so my question is regarding CARES and the city's response to COVID because there was nothing in the presentation that really hit on that. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the allocation of the CARES money. And my understanding right now is that the city of Sparks did get significantly less than some of the other cities maybe in Nevada. But if you could talk a little bit about the allocation of that funds um, and then talk about like the city's response to COVID um, in general. So well, I think one of the things that we're probably most proud of is a regional approach uh, that we've, we've opened what we're calling the Nevada CARES campus. Using some of that COVID money, uh, Sparks put in roughly $4 million into the campus. The rest of the region, Reno and Washoe County, uh, made up the difference on the other 16 million. It's gonna be a place where you will have emergency shelter. Uh, we'll also have the services, the wraparound services so that we can uh, learn everything from checking account uh, to self-sufficiency, uh, attaining housing, uh, you know, that's complete service. And, and then we're gonna also have an area where we think uh, it'd be transitional type housing. So where you can stay a little bit longer, you'll pay some rent, but uh, we'll, we'll continually teach you the, the things to make you a viable part of the community. The one thing that we've, we've learned in all of this, uh, we have a community homeless advisory board that I've sat on since its inception about three years ago, is around 70 to 80% of the people that are homeless have some type of underlying mental health issue. And that's the part we're not doing well as, well as, as a nation. Quite frankly, we, we really need to address the mental health part. Uh, drugs and alcohol abuse come from that mental health. You know, obviously they're, they're self-medicating for some reason or the other. And, and that's, that's, you know, also a byproduct of it. But we have something that we've done in Sparks that's unique to the area. And we're very, very excited about this program. We call it our HOPE team. It's the Homeless Outreach Proactive Engagement Team. And it's uh, four officers and they do nothing but contact homeless people. Now, they don't arrest them, they don't harass them, they just contact them and they say, hey, we have services available, do you want services? And they bring along with them the most team from the, the, the Washoe County, and they're able to connect people with services. And it could be something as simple as, my dog doesn't have shots, so I can't get an apartment. We hooked up people to get shots for their dog or I don't have an ID. That's one of the more common ones. We're helping them get IDs. We just got a story, a, a great success story of a, a lady and her son who've been homeless basically her whole life. The son has never lived in a house. And through our HOPE team, we, we, uh, we have managed to find them shelter. We've had this team in existence now for about nine, 10 months when we put 30 people so far into some type of services and long-term uh, recovery. So we're pretty, we're very, very proud of that. We are bringing on the Sheriff's Department with us in uh, the July timeframe area, and we're hoping the city of Reno comes on at the same time because homelessness is a huge uh, issue and it's not just localized to any one city or, or region, it's, it's the entire country. We think that uh, our Built for Zero Homeless Initiative is, is going to be a, a great success in the future. So that, that was what we're most proud of and part of that COVID money. As you know, early on, a lot of our COVID money got used for overtime for our officers and our firemen who were exposed to the, the, the COVID and, and we had to quarantine them for two weeks and obviously we have to pay them for that because of on the job type of deal. So we used a lot of money there. And then we've also uh, put about three and a half million dollars into rental assistance for anybody in the city of Spark. And this is just for the city of Spark. And then we put another million dollars towards uh, businesses for their rental assistance and whatnot during that, that period of time also. But we'll be happy to send you a breakdown of exactly how we spent every nickel. And I don't know if you had a, a follow up, Vice Chair, just wanted to make sure. No, I'm good, thank you. I appreciate that response. Next, we have Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, and, and thank you, Mayor Lawson. Uh, as you know, I'm a second generation Sparks native, and so I am incredibly proud of my, my uh, 
my hometown that my grandparents came to from Ireland. So I kind of, I'm not going to lie, I kind of bristled a bit when some, when uh, we get referred to as a commuter community for Reno because I see Sparks as its own community. So, but I also understand that that, that was trying to teach some people where exactly we were located. Uh, so I've got two questions. Um, I'm so happy that you brought up the HOPES program. That was uh, really well done because I was going to ask for some more specifics on that. But one of the larger questions I have has to do with the police force. And I know that there were some issues over the summer and, and some other things that had happened in the past. And so I uh, was just asking about some of the, di the diversity trainings and how uh, our many different populations, because uh, as I think we all know, uh, Sparks has a very robust a Latino community, a Filipino community, it's, it's many different um, nationalities that are represented. So how is our police force um, doing when it comes to diversity trainings? So as you know, the COVID uh, response has taken a toll on a lot of people and it took its toll on our police chief. Um, our, our police chief decided that he had to retire and he retired in October. We have a new police chief now who's put, uh, who started to put in some new programs. We are doing diversity training. That will start very shortly. He, our new police chief has also talked about a community advisory board to, uh, to be advisory in nature to the police department. And, and then of course, uh, our officer of mental health is the most important thing to us. Uh, we, we lost, uh, Sorry, kind of a, it's emotional for me. Um, we, we lost one of our policemen to uh, suicide. And uh, it's hard for me because my dad was a cop in Vegas for 30 years. So it is very close to home. But uh, we don't we don't want any more of that. Uh, suicides on our walk dogs. And so we have we have instituted a program where once a year, uh, just, just like you get a physical, uh, they'll get a mental health checkup. And I, okay. Thank you for, for sharing that. I, I know that that was a very difficult situation for for our members of our police force and, and also for our community. Uh, but when it comes to outreach to our minorities, how is that going? I realize that again, we have a brand new, um, a, bl a brand new police chief, and and so is you know, for this advisory committee that is being uh, discussed, are there discussions where there will in fact be people from different communities? And that absolutely is is the thought behind that is that it is a cross representation of the entire community. Um, it's it's going to be you know it's obviously there's many many different models, and uh, we're trying to figure out the best model for us that that's going to work. But I will tell you that since I've been on the council for the last ten years, we've always been community policing. Uh, we do that on a, on regular occasions. In the summertime, you know, uh, we'll support uh, the kids uh, lemonade stand, and you'll see four or five cop cars show up and buy lemonade. Uh, we have barbecues that please uh, come out. I'm so sorry. I think you're cutting in and out. Just sorry, sorry about that. But I think what you're saying is during the summertime, there's a large amount of community outreach based upon the different City of Sparks programs, maybe? Or is that just me making a guess based upon my experiences in Sparks? It's it's through the police department and what they do at the police department. You know, they, they have some barbecues. They uh, support, you know, the kids that have the lemonade stand and stuff. Uh, so it's they're doing the community outreach all the time. Uh, obviously, COVID has put a put an end to all of that for the short term. But uh, you know, it, it's I think our police department overall does a wonderful job. Thank you. And then my other question, and and we can do this offline if you like, is I think we talked about this during our conversation um, in January, was it uh, about the housing costs? And you mentioned it, but when a one bedroom apartment that is being opened up in that downtown Sparks area is $1,000 a month, uh, hmm, uh, what is the average housing cost right now in, in the Sparks area? Do you know, or I think it's more I, regional, but 
how is that impacting some of our other outreach programs as well? If you could go into that a little bit more. I, I couldn't tell you what the exact number is, but I know that the newer apartments range anywhere from a thousand dollars on up to twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars a month, depending on on what it is and, and how, how big the apartment is. But uh, our bigger problem is, you know, we we literally are having people move here with cash that are able to pay uh, above uh, the appraised prices for homes. And it's driving our home prices through the roof. Um, right now, the city of Reno is median house is $500,000. In the city of Sparks, median house is $400,000. So uh, I'm, at, I'm also to, to a point myself where I'm, I might not be able to afford my own house at this point. So it's, it's something that can really only be addressed by creating more housing. And we have plans for that with our city centers. And one of the things that, that every city in America would love to have a river run through it. And Sparks has a river that runs through it. And we're gonna convert some of our uh, tilt up concrete that's down there along the river and change that into multifamily houses and, and then create another city center there. So city centers help us in the mode of transportation using the public transportation and then connecting the different areas. So if you want a river experience, you go to the river area. If you want a downtown entertainment experience, you go to the Victorian Square area. And then if you want a, an experience uh, with artists and artist lofts and uh, you know people that are creative in that nature, we have the Audi district uh, that's it's up and coming. So we're working hard on that uh, to diversify and to provide additional housing. That And to me, that's the only way we're really going to drive housing prices down is, just, is the supply has to outweigh the demand. And, and thank you. And I also want to just reiterate how proud I am to be from Sparks um, and just my history with it and how much I love my community. And thank you for your service. And also thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me so many questions. Thank you, Assemblywoman. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Assemblywoman. I don't believe we have any additional questions, but I wanted to give those of you an opportunity that I may have accidentally skipped uh, free to unmute yourself and state your name for the record if you have an additional question. It appears that we do not. Uh, Mayor, thank you again for, for joining us today and, and uh, uh, allowing us to uh, learn a little bit more about Sparks. I think a lot of folks just don't know enough and we'll use Assemblywoman Dickman and some uh, Assemblywoman Anderson here as, as a guide. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the presentation by the City of Sparks and broadcast next. If we could invite those wishing to speak in public comment to do so at this time, I wanna remind those of you wishing to speak in public comment to uh, keep your comments to two minutes and that you remain respectful. To take place in public comment queue, please press star nine now. Caller with the last three digits of 653. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, good morning. Thanks to um, everyone. I appreciate your time and my name is Dora Martinez and I represent the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition. And to the mayor of Sparks and your staff, I love your city. I used to live there and I moved to Reno. Um, I am totally blind and having little kids, it was so difficult to find transportation to go to the stores that are were far from um, my house. So I think that's something that we need to work on, you know, grocery stores and um, um, and, and usable sidewalks. Because as you know, as being blind, you know, it'll be against the life. I have a license and drive a car. So I use a lot of my Chevrolet legs, a lot of walk, a lot of walk. Um, I do want to um, bring the attention when you please, when you do training for officers, um, please include 
sensitivity training for people with disability. We would be happy to come, um, you know, and and um, support you with that. Um, I think it is important. Not you know, Black Lives Matter, but everybody's life matters and everybody's perspective and and um, and understanding of one situation. Um, so if you, just for the record, um, we work through the Nevada Assistive Technology Resource Center, which is located at the University of Nevada, Reno, and the good phone number is 775-682-9070. Thank you so much and take care. Bless you all. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, we'd like to invite uh, anybody else wishing to speak in public comment. If we could go to the next caller. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no more callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the engagement today, members, as always. Um, I wanna remind you that tomorrow we're gonna be meeting again at 9 a.m. and we're gonna be hearing bills uh, AB 21 and AB 70. Uh, please make sure you give yourself an opportunity to review those ahead of time, reach out with any questions. Uh, and with that, this means adjourned.